tales for dark nights. Oh, sorry. Hey, not so fast there. <gasps> wow! Archibald Carlyle! Uh, uh, call me a... Hey there, guy. Ooh, I'm so excited! Uh, how about you don't do that, okay? Yes, sir! You must be the newest intern around here. What's your name? I'm Neil. I just started and I'm, I'm already excited. Yeah, you said that already, kid. M Mr. Half asked me to bring these notes to GM to read on the air. Mr. Half? Who the hell is Mr. Oh, the other half. Uh, sorry, Neil. Hey, could you come here for a second? Sure thing. Uh, come closer and bend down to my level. And, uh, why don't you call me Mr. Carlyle? Uh, of course, Miss. Mr. Carlyle? Good boy. Step right up and prepare to be unsettled. You have left behind your safe reality and fallen into the darkness. There is no escape and there is no reprieve. I am GM Danielson. Your guide through these twisted worlds of the most disturbed imagination. They say that sometimes the most frightening things are those that you cannot see. And from our horrifying experiences, you become very familiar with how effective unsettling sounds can be. You know how a deep rumbling unsettles your tummy and your soul? How an almost silent whisper blowing by your ear sends your courage deep into hiding? How both the scurrying of claws on a hard surface and the bellowing of a demonic entity turn the spine to jelly? So, for our opening episode of the second season of the Simply Scary Podcast, we will be devoting our exploration to both ends of the audio spectrum. Both screams and whispers. Now, let us begin our oral assault. Alright, GM, here's the notes I was asked to give to you. Before we get things started, Archibald has reminded me to share some very important news with you. In preparation for our upcoming animated series, we at Simply Scary have a community survey open to both our patrons and audience at large. If you are one of those people who likes contributing to the shaping of a project in any way, shape or form, we invite you to join us at simplyscarypodcast.com forward slash survey forward slash to share your thoughts. We all remember the nostalgia of childhood and how certain experiences can draw you closer to those days of yore. But when a young man's family life takes a tragic turn, he may find the link to his childhood could be a curse that has been released on an unsuspecting world. Kristen Holland performs Max Shepard's Ladder to Oblivion.
A cursory internet search will reveal that there were 91 unlicensed NES games. But I know that's not true. There's one more, and I've seen it. It's real, and its name is Ladder to Oblivion. I'll tell you as much as I can, and I hope that by the end you'll understand why I will never play it. As you probably know, Nintendo created a worldwide phenomenon in North America in 1986 when it released its Nintendo Entertainment System, the NES. By that time, more than 2.5 million units of the console had already been sold in Japan. The success of the system in America single-handedly revitalized the struggling video game industry. By 1990, 30% of American households owned the NES, beating the percentage that owned personal computers by 7%. I grew up in one of those households. I remember my dad bringing the NES home for the first time, beaming with pride. I was in complete awe. I remember sitting in our sunken living room and playing Super Mario Brothers for hours upon hours. What I didn't know back then was that making games for the NES was big business. Part of the reason the system was so successful was because Nintendo actively courted third-party developers for its fledgling system. Because Nintendo possessed a near monopoly on the video game market, they were able to enforce their standards and policies with an iron fist. Eventually, this got the attention of the United States Department of Justice, which started looking into the company's business practices. Once the Federal Trade Commission got involved, Nintendo changed some of the strict terms of its agreements. By Nintendo's count, there were 671 licensed games for the NES. That list grows to 677 if you include the three 10-gen games that were only temporarily licensed, and several others, such as Miracle Piano, which were left off Nintendo's list for unknown reasons. To enforce its licensing standards, Nintendo created the 10NES authentication chip. When the system detected the chip in the cartridge, the game would be playable. Otherwise, no dice. As you can imagine, many companies either didn't want to pay the licensing fee or were rejected as officially licensed partners by Nintendo based on the quality of their games. Hence the 91 unlicensed games. To skirt the protection of the 10 NES chips, some companies configured their hardware to create a several millisecond voltage spike that short-circuited the authentication chip for just a moment, thus allowing their game to be played. Interesting stuff, right? Well, I thought so, and so did my father. He worked for Nintendo in the development and licensing department during the late 80s and early 90s, and got to experience all of the drama as it happened. However, the story of Ladder to Oblivion, the game that never was, does not begin with my dad. It begins with Rob, the founder of a game development company, and his idea for a new kind of video game. Rob was in his senior year at West Lafayette High School in Indiana when Super Mario Brothers was released for the NES. Like thousands of other kids around the country, he quickly became obsessed. After graduation, Rob decided to attend Purdue University to study computer science. He wanted to make video games. Purdue's computer sciences department moved into a newly renovated building in the fall of 1985, and Rob took full advantage of it when he started college the next year. Four years later, he graduated with honors at the top of his class. My dad always said Rob was one of the smartest people he'd ever met. Regrettably, he said, Rob also had some serious personal demons. Rob's father was murdered during a home invasion when he was young. His mother was spared and raised him on her own. Unfortunately, the trauma she had experienced sent her careening through years of alcoholism and depression. Unsurprisingly, Rob was neglected. And it was only a matter of time before Child Protective Services stepped in and took custody of him. At first, he acted out, but eventually Rob rose above the unfortunate hand he'd been dealt. When Super Mario Brothers came out in his senior year, it seemed as if he'd found the escape he'd been seeking. My father told me the story about the day he first spoke to Rob a dozen times. It was May 25th, 1992, and he was sitting at his desk when the phone rang. The voice on the other side hesitated for a moment, and then said in a rush, How'd you like to be rich? My dad had heard a version of that question a hundred times, and typically hung up immediately upon hearing it. 
but that time was different. Something in the man's voice intrigued him. I'd love to, he joked. Do you have a secret to winning the lottery? The voice on the other end of the line was humorless. I've got something much better. And what's that? My dad shot back. A new type of game, one the world has never seen before. I'm listening, my dad replied. Rob introduced himself as the president of a fledgling game company called LTO. At the time, my father had no idea Rob was the company's sole proprietor. The young man went on to describe the game he was working on as a platformer, where the player moved across the screen from left to right, collecting items and power-ups and fighting enemies along the way. At the end of each level, there would be a boss, with an ultimate boss at the end of the game. My dad informed Rob that Nintendo had already produced a game like that, to which Rob confidently replied, The differences are in the details. According to Rob, his game would begin with a young man who finds a strange wooden ladder protruding out of the ground. Upon climbing down the ladder, the character would discover that he couldn't go back up again. The only way would be forward. Just like real life, Rob remarked. At the end of each level, the player would battle a demon that appeared in the form of someone from their past. In every case, the enemy took the form of someone, perhaps a teacher, a parent, or a friend, who had harmed the main character in the past. After defeating the demon, the player climbed down to the next level. Nine levels had been planned. In each subsequent stage, the screen would become darker and the enemies more powerful. By the ninth and final level, the player would barely be able to see their way through the darkness. At the very end, the ultimate boss appeared, and the player would discover the truth, that the entity they'd been after the entire time was none other than a mirror image of themselves. Defeating the final boss would reveal a new ladder that led back up to the surface. What happens when the player fails? My dad asked. You don't want to know, Rob cryptically responded. Okay, so what's this game called? Dad asked. Ladder to Oblivion. Rob replied, nearly whispering. Eventually, Rob convinced Dad to meet with him in order to show him the game. It wasn't quite finished, but the young developer promised that the first seven levels were playable. My father was mesmerized. He told me it made him feel like no game ever had before. He began to see the bosses at the end of each level as the people who had wronged him, a fourth grade teacher who once humiliated him in front of his class, an old high school friend that he claimed had stolen his girlfriend. It was as if the game changed depending on who was playing it. When my dad brought the game to Nintendo, they refused to approve Rob's company as an officially licensed developer. Nintendo had very strict rules about the type of content that their partners could include in their games. Among other things, nudity, gore, cursing, and religious symbols were prohibited. Ladder to Oblivion's theme and content violated none of these restrictions, but it was rejected all the same. It was simply too dark, the higher-ups argued. Rob was crushed. Dad said, understandably so. He'd worked on Ladder to Oblivion for the better part of three years, my dad told me the day of the final rejection was the last time he'd ever spoken to Rob. I begged my father many times to try and get in touch with Rob. Maybe he still had a copy of the game and we could play it together, for old time's sake. Maybe, he said to me once, averting his gaze. I'll see if I can dig up his number. At some point, I forgot all about Ladder to Oblivion and figured the story ended just the way my father said all those years ago. but I was wrong. This past week, my father committed suicide. My mother found him in the woods behind our house, the shotgun he'd used lying several inches from his outstretched hand. The news was totally unexpected and was a shock to my entire family. My dad was a happy man. As far as I knew, he'd never suffered from depression. I was devastated. Seeking closure, I visited my dad's study. 
He and I had spent hours in there together, playing old NES games and reliving his days at Nintendo. On a whim, I grabbed Super Mario Brothers out of its case, intending to play a final round in his honor. When I went to put it in, I found another game inside. That was odd, I thought. Dad never left games inside the console. He used to tell me it made them wear out quicker. The art was just how I'd pictured it all those years. An 8-bit image of a ladder descending into a raging fire. It was ladder to oblivion. That's when I noticed the note taped to the back of the console. I pulled it free and saw the first line said simply, To my son. I considered reciting the letter in its entirety, but decided against it. The words don't reflect my dad's personality in the slightest. They're too... dark. So I'll paraphrase instead. The day Ladder to Oblivion was rejected, Rob and my father discussed things at length, and my father was invited to become a partner at LTO. Together, he and Rob would complete Ladder to Oblivion and release it as an unlicensed game. My dad knew all about Nintendo's authentication chip and how to work around it. He and Rob both understood that many companies had already produced successful unlicensed games. However, they knew there were risks. There was a distinct possibility that Nintendo could, at any time, devise new methods to prevent the playing of unauthorized games. In spite of their concerns, Rob and my father decided to take their chances. Dad accepted Rob's offer, on the condition that his involvement remain private. His day job was what paid the bills, after all. Seven months later, Ladder to Oblivion was completed. Rob called my dad and told him the news. Dad was excited beyond measure. The next day, he had the game loaded onto two pre-production cartridges. He even had a trusted friend in the art department whip up a label complete with Nintendo's seal of quality. That way, Dad reasoned, they'd think he was working on something for the company. Rob insisted on doing a complete playthrough on his own in order to catch any remaining bugs and promised to call my father once he'd finished. They agreed they would meet afterwards, at which point my dad would test the game as well and discuss the next steps. When five days passed with no word from Rob, Dad set out for his partner's house and showed up unannounced. They hadn't spoken since the phone call and Dad had begun to worry that Rob had released the game on his own and cut him out of the profits. What he discovered was much worse. Rob was dead. At that point in the letter, my father began ranting about God and the devil, and his writing became borderline illegible. Sentences were scribbled over so heavily that they became virtually indecipherable. I was able to make out that Rob had left a note, which consisted of only four words. Never climb the ladder. At the end of the page, my dad hastily scrawled what he suspected had led to Rob's fate. He finally faced himself. While Dad was terribly upset at Rob's death, he was undeterred. Ladder to Oblivion had taken control of his life. Ever since he'd played it that first time, he'd been battling a secret depression, something that I don't think anyone knew. The only thing he believed would make him happy again would be to release the game to the public. The following day, my dad partnered with an entrepreneurial-minded friend from his college days by the name of Eddie. That night, they got together to play the game. Dad started, but ended up leaving after the seventh level to grab some pizza. When he returned, he found Eddie dead, with game over flashing on the screen. Both of his partner's wrists had been slashed, with strange symbols carved into the flesh. My father's note gets harder and harder to read from that point, but it seems as if he was trying to describe the symbols he'd seen. Either way, I couldn't make heads or tails of it. At that point, he says he was convinced the game was responsible for both Rob and Eddie's deaths, as well as his worsening depression. He tucked the game away, vowing to never play it again. But he couldn't quite bear to get rid of it. 
For 24 years, my dad kept his promise. He never played the game all the way through. Until recently, that is. What I'm about to recite next to my father's last words. Verbatim. You can draw your own conclusions. 24 years of guilt finally caught up with me today. I climbed the ladder. Something I said I'd never do. I faced myself. And I was judged unworthy. Just like Rob. Just like Eddie. There's something wrong with the letter. Almost like consciousness. It's more than just the sum of its parts. It looks deep inside you. Too deep for light. To the places you didn't know existed. Son, I don't want to die. I want to live. But my shotgun is sitting on the floor beside me and I can hear it speaking to me. It sounds so sweet. Its voice is a siren's song. If I can ignore it, I'll tear up this letter and you'll never know the difference. I'm sorry I lied to you. I'm sorry for a lot of things. Please know that I love you. Please move on. I'm going outside. I can't take it. Please. Never climb the ladder. It knows. I, for one, believe my dad. No matter what you all might say. He never told me what happened to Rob's copy of the game. For all I know, it's still out there. <laughs> Game over. A most frightening phrase for those basement berserkers out there. But when you are faced with those words in the world of the Simply Scary Podcast, there are no continues. After this message, we will see what is next in our mixed bag of bedeviling goodies. Well, well, boys and girls. Just wanted to check in with you here. Hope you're enjoying the season premiere of the Simply Scary Podcast. Just wanted to make sure that you're ready for the Kickstarter project for us to start an animated series based on our Chilling Tales for Dark Nights material. So, hit that subscribe button below to stay up to date on all the latest information. I also wanted to let you know to drop in on GM Danielson's YouTube channel, Horror Readings by GM Danielson, to enjoy some really primo narrations by the man himself. You can also check out my YouTube at Jesse Cornett, and sign up in the patrons area to get unreleased music from my revolving door music project, Son of Man, as heard in today's story, Double Bass Kick. You can accost GM on Twitter, at Danielson Horror, and myself, at Jesse Cornett 667 Be sure to follow the show at Simply Scary Show, where you can catch our Friday Night Retro Flick Picks for a great way to spend a Friday night. Be sure to get your horror fix with Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Turn off the lights, and turn on the dark. Now, back to the show. Children love to build and connect things. I remember as a child building my first guillotine. 
Ah, what a surprisingly successful class project. Uh, how was I supposed to guess one of those others would be foolish enough to actually stick his head in a... Uh, uh, never mind. Uh, where was I? Uh, oh, yes. Children love to build, and our next story will chill you to the bone as a mother tries to piece together the mystery of her son's new construction project. But it's what she will hear that will resurrect something frighteningly ominous. Jordan Lester performs Anton Scheller's NOLA. Stein scrambled out of his room into the living room, and then behind the couch that I was sitting on. I noticed he had something in his hand when he came in, but he's five now, and I thought it wouldn't be anything dangerous. I heard him playing and laughing behind me while some soap opera played on. Don't move, he said. That made me curious. I just wanted to see what he was playing with. I leaned over the back of the sofa, and he was sitting there with something white in his hand. It took me a moment to understand what was in front of him on the carpet. Th there were the bones of a complete human leg, and that he was just putting the last toe in place. Get away from that! I don't remember what I screamed, but I grabbed his arm and pulled him away. The police came soon after, and they searched his room. They had an expert come in, and he said that it was real bone, likely from a child. Later, they brought a search dog. Stein didn't want to say where he found the bones. I promised sweets. I promised a trip to the zoo. The officers even offered him a ride-along in a real police car and that he could use the siren. When my husband came home, he threatened that Stein couldn't get any more sweets until he would tell. That wasn't any more effective. It just made him cry. Every time we asked, Stein kept saying that he couldn't tell. And whenever we asked why he couldn't tell, he just pressed his lips together and shook his head. I was sure that he had come from his room. The police took his room apart, then the rest of the apartment. Even the dog found nothing. Stein cried a lot that evening, even after the police left. He said he didn't understand why everyone was so mean to him, and why the police were hurting his furniture, that he was just helping Nola. I'm not sure if he didn't want to say who Nola was, or if he himself really didn't know. The police said we could stay, but that we should probably keep Stein with us and not allow him to enter his room. Not as if I would have done that. Stein was between us, cuddled up against me with his father's arm on top of both of us. George and Stein were both fast asleep, but I remember staring at them for hours. It felt like a waking nightmare, but at some point I must have drifted off. George's shouting woke me up. George shouting and then Stein crying. When I sat up, Stein was just pressing his body against the bedroom wall near the foot of our bed. George pulled Stein away. Where did you get those? George screamed. The panic in George's face was even greater than the panic in Stein's face. The door was open. We had definitely locked it. And on the floor, right between our bed and the wall, were another leg and a hip bone and the lower vertebra of a spine. George shouted at me to watch Stein and call the police. He threw Stein into my arms and he ran into the living room. I saw him check the front door. Then he returned and ran into Stein's room. Stein cried next to me. I just looked at the bones on the floor. They were so perfectly arranged, the way you would see a skeleton in a museum. It took a while before I managed to finally grab my mobile, pull Stein close, and dial the number. 
George found the front door and all the windows locked. He even checked whether somebody might have gotten in through the former fireplace. But he found Stein's room open. We had definitely locked that, too. Open, just like the bedroom door, but not broken into. Just unlocked. The only key we have for those doors, the one that fits all the internal doors, was still in George's nightstand. George said he woke up because Stein was giggling and talking to himself. So he got up, walked around the bed, and there he was, arranging the bones. Stein is usually happy and very open to friendly adults, but he was scared of the police. He didn't want to be in the same room as the officers. They organized a child psychologist, a young woman dressed in normal clothes. She offered Stein sweets and a book. She was very nice to him. But the whole time she was there, Stein just tried to hide behind my legs and screamed whenever she got too close. We wanted to go to a hotel, but the upstairs neighbors were awake and took us in for the night. When the police finally left us alone and the neighbors had retreated to their bedroom, Stein spoke again. He said that the police are bad people, that they hurt Nola very much and stole her leg. Still, when we asked questions about Nola or the bones, he just shook his head. Stein fell asleep on the neighbor's armchair. We decided that at least one of us should keep watch for the remainder of the night. I told George to nap first. He always gets grim and grumpy when he's tired. Then I couldn't get myself to wake him, and I just stayed awake until morning. For those three hours, I sat and watched Stein. There was nothing specific to watch, just his calm breathing and the occasional smile that hushed over his lips, until he turned so that I couldn't see his face. Despite all the commotion, I felt warm and relaxed seeing him like that. At seven, the neighbors got up. I heard their alarm, a muffled conversation, then they disappeared in the bathroom. At around 7.30, they came into the living room, and George, too, woke up. George went to the bathroom. The neighbors asked me whether we were hungry. I was numb from the tiredness and was craving more for coffee than food. I went to the kitchen to help. It cannot have been more than five minutes. I walked back into the living room with the plates in my hand. I saw the empty armchair and looked around the room. I called for Stein, and nearly in the same moment I saw the open front door. The plates nearly fell on the table. Our apartment door was open. I heard Stein speaking to someone. Then I made the turn, and he sat there on the living room floor. With a heap of bones. I grabbed his arms to pull him away, but he screamed and fought back, and when I kept pulling, he bit my arm. I screamed and pulled back, and within a fraction of a second, he had turned back to the bones, to arranging them. He was so incredibly quick. He just picked a bone from the heap, and within a moment, it was on the floor, in the right place, and another bone in his hand. Not ten seconds, and he had nearly arranged a whole hand. Then I finally managed to pull him away, even as he was screaming and trying to wiggle free or bite. George came running in, grabbed Stein from my hands, and carried him out of the room. Stein was still screaming and howling out in the corridor, and on the floor right in front of me, next to the heap and already arranged, were vertebra, ribs, and a few bones from both arms and a nearly completed hand. I think, if not for the neighbor's testimony, the police wouldn't have believed us a single word. The officers searched our place a third time, even with a new dog, and again they found nothing. At least a dozen officers were going in and out of the apartment, but this time Stein didn't want to hide. Instead, he wanted to pat the dog. He was with us on the corridor, running his hands through the dog's fur while we were talking to an officer about how to proceed. I looked at the officer's face. A moment later, I turned back around and Stein was gone. There were a lot of people searching him and shouting his name. The dog was running wild through the apartment. 
I was pure, shivering panic, running in and out of Stein's room. I was in the living room. It was just a flash, a moment between all the noise that I heard his voice. His giggling. I screamed, Quiet! And everybody stopped in their tracks. Even the dog obeyed. And there he was again, giggling. Then he spoke. His voice was faint, as if from far away. Don't worry, Nola. They won't find us here. Within a few minutes, they had ripped open the fireplace, only to find nothing. George was holding me, but seeing the bare pipe and stones down there made my chest clench together. George stopped breathing, too. Then there he was again, giggling, louder than before. I called his name. Oh, no, he whispered. Mom found us. The dog's head twitched. In that moment, I knew. I told them to break through the floor, right in front of the chimney. Within a few minutes, they broke through a layer of wood and stone, right into an empty space, a tight tunnel. After that, we heard him coughing. I called him again. I'm not finished playing, he said. George told him that he would have to come out, that we were waiting for him. And a minute later, he came crawling through the tunnel. He was carrying a skull that he carefully set down. We hugged him. After a few moments, he shook himself free. Then he went to pet the dog. They didn't find much else down there. The tunnel ended abruptly at the end of the house, and at the end were a few more small bones from the same body and some of Stein's toys. We still don't know how he got down there. He always just said that Nola let him in. My husband thinks that's crazy, that there must have been a hidden entrance somewhere. But I know Stein isn't lying. Because the others didn't hear when Stein whispered, Oh no, Mom found us. And a girl's voice replied, Don't worry. They never look down here. Ultimately, we learn that the hip bone is connected to the thigh bone, is connected to the leg bone, is connected to one damned creepy little ankle biter. Hmm, children are such gifts of ghoulishness and surprisingly low calorie when prepared just right. After a brief word, neither screamed nor whispered, we will return for the final leg of our journey. Good evening, loyal listeners. This is Pendleton Arkwright. Thanks for listening, and if you like what I do, don't forget to add me on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Gabriel dot Benedict with a K dot three. Or check out some of my poetry on YouTube or PoetrySoup.com. Just search for Pendleton Arkwright. Thanks again for listening, and God bless. Evil Idol finalist come featured performer Kristen Holland now has a YouTube channel. Nocturnal Transmissions. We gave you every chance to do the decent thing. Nonsense! But the shape wasn't of any hand we'd ever seen. Please don't kill me! With a baboon's blood! His palace had become a graveyard. Just search for Nocturnal Transmissions channel on YouTube and follow the Crescent Moon. Welcome back, everyone. We are sorry that we have had to leave you trembling in fear once again. 
But before we go, let us explore what is upcoming in the world of the Simply Scary podcast. First, it is extremely important that if you cannot or will not support us monetarily, we insist that you allow the ads to play through in our videos and occasionally click on them to assert your viewership. This is a way for you to lend your support without opening your wallet. In relation, we would like to alert you to a format change here on the Simply Scary podcast. Beginning with this episode, we will be offering our patrons an extended version of the show, featuring more stories and without the annoying pop-up ads. Go to simplyscarypodcast.com to learn more about the change in programming and how you can get access to even more Simply Scary. Next up, February of 2017 will be here before we know it. And with it will come our most ambitious project yet. Creating animated adaptations of our audiobook experiences. Working, working with top artist David Romero, we will venture to take our terror to the next level. Check out David's frightening animations on the horror short films playlist on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel. Our terrifying audio and David's gut-wrenching animation will combine to make a show worthy of your patronage. Click that subscribe button below to be alerted of the start of our campaign, to receive updates on our most recent posts, and to be apprised of the amazing rewards we have in store for you if you help support us. Uh, and speaking of patronage, if you can't wait to lend your support to us, become a patron after the show and you will be supporting independent entertainment that devours the competition. Go to simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons at the top of the page to take the tour and get access to all our content and unreleased material that you will find nowhere else. Our final announcement is regarding our giveaways at the end of the show. We will be transitioning from choosing iTunes reviews to choosing winners from comments left on our YouTube videos of the latest episodes of the Simply Scary Podcast. So take the time after listening to the show to comment about your experience. Tell us what you think, or just plain show your love. Constructive comments will be chosen randomly to receive a special gift from us at the Simply Scary Podcast and Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. This is G.M. Danielson, thanking you for joining us. Remember, listeners, when you experience low-volume voices from ragged throats whispering into your minds, the sound that follows could be the sound of your own demise. Until next time, hold your breath and silence your screams, for you are just experiencing the Simply Scary Podcast. This is executive producer Jesse Cornett. If you like what you hear, be sure to check out more from these authors at simplyscarypodcast.com. There you can find all information regarding the show and the stories appearing here in our podcast. The Simply Scary Podcast is a production of Chilling Entertainment. The showcase is written by Jesse Cornett and Dustin Kosky and produced by Jesse Cornett. The host of the Simply Scary Podcast is GM Danielson. Original music during the show by Jesse Cornett. This broadcast was directed and created by Craig Groshek. Be sure to look for the Simply Scary Podcast on iTunes. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star review. Comments or questions? Email us at contact at simplyscarypodcast.com and check our website for more information. While you're there, consider clicking on the patrons link at the top of the page to help support our show. Copyright Chilling Entertainment, LLC, 2017. Thanks for listening. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.